maybe you realize, why did we sing a song about the Ten Commandments? Well, we're going to begin a series in our uh, Communion Sundays on the Ten Commandments, so you'll know what we're doing for the next ten months. And hopefully every month we'll sing that song, and then you'll be memorizing it, and you'll be singing it uh, as you're doing laundry, and walking the dog, and whatever you're doing as you're doing your doing. You'll be singing the song. Well, let's start today by reading our covenant. It's on the handout or in the back of your hymn book. And so you have a choice to that. Let's read together in unison, if you please. Having been led, as we believe, by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we do now, in the presence of God, angels, and this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge, holiness, and spiritual care, to promote its prosperity and spirituality, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline, and doctrine, to give it a sacred preeminence over all institutions of human origin, to contribute cheerfully and regularly to the support of the ministry, the expenses of the church, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel through all nations. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotions, to spiritually instruct our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintances, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be just in our dealings, faithful in our engagements, and exemplary in our behavior, to avoid all tattling, backbiting, and excessive anger, to abstain from anything that would lead to addiction, to be zealous in our efforts to advance the kingdom of our Savior. We further engage to watch over one another in brotherly love, to remember each other in prayer, to aid each other in sickness and distress, to cultivate Christian sympathy and feeling and courtesy in speech, to be slow to take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, and mindful of the rules of our Savior to secure it without delay. We moreover engage that when we remove from this place, we will as soon as possible unite with another church of like precious faith, where we can carry out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Thank you. As we open up the study about the Ten Commandments, I'd like you to have your Bible open to uh, Exodus uh, chapter 19. We're going to be doing some background before that. We're looking at God's standards for living, and we believe that they are absolute, not obsolete. I receive a daily devotional from Dr. Jeremiah, and recently one of his devotionals talked about truth, and I wanted to share that quote with you because I think it's really a good quote. He said, in recent years, a new phrase has entered the cultural conversation, my truth. Have you heard that? Yes. Or your truth. Uh, many people have replaced it with the idea of the truth. Social media has made it possible for every person to speak his or, his or her truth to the world. This trend is a fallout from the rise of the postmodern worldview that says there is no truth. Instead, truth is in the eye of the beholder. Truth is whatever you say it is. This is the world we live in, pluralistic world, relative world. But we are those who believe the Bible teaches that God gave the Ten Commandments. There's no doubt that we are living in a moral decay, and that the moral decay is directly related to the rejection of God's law. I remember talking to my father about this years ago. Uh, he passed about six years ago now, but I remember talking to him about how he attended Teaneck High School, and every single day he would read the Bible in school. In high school, a public high school, read the Bible. Some of you are nodding your heads you experience the same thing. It's not surprising to notice that as soon as they cut that out, all of a sudden things went downhill. 
Men have made gods of men. You go all the way back to Stalin and Lenin's embalmed, embalmed bodies that for years were, were viewed religiously. Even John Lennon is considered to be a saint by many. Uh, Barner did a research of Americans, and I found this statistic to be mind-blowing, that 76% 70, of Americans considered themselves to be true to the first commandment. You know what the first commandment says, don't you? In Deuteronomy chapter 19, we're going to open that up. And before we look at 19, chapter 20, it says in verse 3, You shall have no other gods before me. As you look at America, do you think that that statistic is true? No. That people are worshiping God over, over politics, over money, over, po over professional athletes, whoever it might be? Um, I, I want you to remember that when God gave these words, he gave them primarily to Israel, the nation of Israel. People, but a lot of people misinterpret the Bible and they think that the Ten Commandments is a way of salvation. The Ten Commandments is not a way of salvation. The Ten Commandments explains God's moral code for living. The Ten Commandments are listed in two places in the Bible. We should know this like the back of our hand. Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5. So, where are the Ten Commandments listed in the Bible? Good. You'll never forget that. Often they're referred to as the Ten Words. Sometimes they're referred to as the words spoken by Jehovah or the words of the covenant. Um, Matthew 19, 17, if you're familiar with that, Jesus speaking to the rich young ruler said, keep the commandments. And then in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 2, Paul said, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. We'll get to that when we get to that commandment. But Exodus 32 to 34 tells us that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he was carrying the two tablets of stone. If you follow me, you know I love to find an artist's picture of this. And no doubt we found one. It's a beautiful portrait, which was done by Rembrandt. And it depicts Moses breaking the Ten Commandments. Why did Moses break the Ten Commandments? Because he came down and he found the people worshiping a golden calf that they had made. And he threw the tablets down, symbolizing that Israel was violating the commandments that God had just given to Moses. Moses then is invited by Jehovah to go back up onto the Mount of Olives, or Mount of uh, Sinai, rather, with two new tablets and to record what God said. So this is the commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean? Back in Exodus 19, follow with me please, the setting. I want us to get the context of these Ten Commandments as we begin. In Exodus 19, beginning in verse 10, Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes. And let them be ready for the third day, for on the third day the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all people. You shall set bounds for the people all around, saying, Take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain or touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. Not a hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot with an arrow, whether man or beast. He shall not live when the trumpet sounds long. They shall come near the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. And he said to the people, Be ready for the third day, and do not come near your wives. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out to the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended 
like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with a voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So here's the context. God wanted the people to prepare themselves before he spoke to them. Don't miss that simple point in the text. And the same is true today. We need to prepare ourselves to hear from God. We just don't rush into God's presence and say, hey, what's going on today? There needs to be a preparation of our heart, and usually that, that focuses upon the confession of our sin, our need for God, our separation from all the other things that are distracting us. And so to have our hearts and minds prepared to hear a message from God. And they were restricted, notice, to come until they were prepared and ready. So come with me to chapter 20. Here's the context again. In verse 1, the Lord God, God spoke these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Egypt is a picture of the world. Bondage is a picture of the sin that we are all born in and the sin that we practice freely in our life. When God first found the people, they were enslaved. And when God first found you and me, we were enslaved. We were enslaved to ourselves and our sin, our nature, Totally depraved, completely lost, because of Adam, we are born in sin. No amount of human strength, intellectual capability can help free us from our sin. Laws do not seek people free. We can only find freedom in Christ. And so we find ourselves enslaved. Verse 2 says, God brought them out. God delivered Israel from their bondage in Egypt. The first 19 chapters of Exodus tell the story of the 10 plagues. And many of you know that each one of those plagues challenged the gods of the Egyptians and who they worship. And God is basically saying to the Egyptians, you don't have a real God. I am God. And so the crossing of the Red Sea, God providing quail, manna, water, in the same way, God brings you and me in Christ out of the bondage that we are born in to deliverance that is in Christ. And so we have verse 2 clearly stating, I am the Lord who has delivered you. I am the Lord who has brought you out of bondage. I am the Lord who has brought you freedom. And if you know Christ today, you can declare the same truth, that you were once in bondage and now you are free. God has brought you out of that position where you were lost. So remember, the two most important things in life are to know that you know God and to know that you will spend eternity with Him. And so God is going to begin to explain to them how they need to know Him in a personal way. So the commandment in verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. What had people done? Turn with me quickly back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is a beautiful depiction of where we are today, of what our culture thinks about God and His Word. And in Romans chapter 1 and verse 19, Paul says, Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Paul declares that God has made Himself known, and people have basically rejected God. People have said, I don't want to hear what God has to say, and they've turned the truth of God into a lie. So what may be known of God is manifest. Every person has some concept of, of a God whom they want to worship. A higher power is a popular phrase. And they reject that. They suppress that, Paul even says in Romans 1. And somebody referred to the God hole, that part of us that is never satisfied until we know who God is in a personal way. So back to the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, the Lord said to his people, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Jesus added to that in your mind. Isn't it interesting that when God made Adam and Eve, he didn't make them or us as robots. We have a free will. We have a choice to make. And God wants us to choose to love him of our own free will. In the bondage that we find ourselves, we're wondering, where are we going to find freedom? And so there is only one God, and yet people have tried to seduce God. I want you to come with me to a number of different scriptures. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I want to consider with you the worldly seductions that we all experience related to God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, it says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, Notice that. Remember the context. Paul is writing here to the Corinthians. How many gods did they worship? Many gods. Lowercase, obviously. And yet Paul says to us Christians, there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. And so God is the source of my truth. It's not my truth, Dave Gruninger's truth. It's God's truth that I choose to accept. And God is the word who speaks authoritatively, and he has spoken in his word. And when we accept that, then we reject the philosophies of the world, which we're going to look at. James chapter 3, or James 4, excuse me, verse 13. Look at this. James says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. How many people think they're in control of their own lives? <laughs> we were down in Virginia, and we heard these reports about an earthquake in New Jersey. I'm sorry, we were not here to miss it. We missed that. Maybe we'll have another one. No, I'm kidding. But, you know, when an earthquake comes, it trembles the ground upon which we stand. It makes us think, could the ground open up and I fall in it? Is the house on insecure? Well, you know, we start to think about the physical things, but what about the spiritual things? I wonder how many people, what day did that happen? Thursday? Friday. 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 One of the great things about going away and being with your grandchildren, you lose track of days. You have to, what day is today? So it happened Friday. I wonder how many people on Friday thought, what's going to happen tomorrow? And then there were aftershocks, right? Uh -huh. There were many aftershocks. And we won't even talk about what our governor decided to do, but that's a whole other issue. Because there were some problems at home and what's going on with our leaders, right? They need to help us. Well, when the foundations are shifting, all of a sudden, people realize they don't have control of their lives. There are all kinds of people. There's type A people, type B people. I don't know if there's a C, D, and E, and F. I'm not sure. But some people are considered control freaks. And James speaks to that. You, you have no control over what's going to happen tomorrow. And people who think they do don't realize that God is in control. Look at Philippians 3.19. Paul says to the Philippians, their end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. What Paul talked about, he's talking about people who look for pleasure as their God. Those whose God is their belly. They're, they're always looking for a good and better meal. There's nothing wrong with good food, but don't make it your God. You know, the motto... Uh, you know, thank God it's Friday because the work week is over and now I can just lose my mind in whatever way I want. No, pleasure is not the answer. First John chapter 2. John makes it so clear in First John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Listen to these words. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, listen to this, all that's in the world, the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Not of the Father, but is of the world. 
the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. So don't love the world. Don't make the world your God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus said, don't make money your God. No one can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So the people who look for money to be their security have no confidence once a crash comes, a financial crash. So Jesus had a lot to say about the commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with, excuse me, with all your soul, with all your mind. When Jesus said we should love God above all, have no other gods before me, verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. What does that mean? Some people think it means this. That God is saying, do not have any other gods that rank ahead of me. I am to be your first and most important God. This would mean that we can have many gods. As long as we keep Jehovah first, we're okay. Is that what the verse is saying? No, no not at all. It really means no other in opposition to me, no other in competition to me, none others in my presence. You see, the point is that God wants our complete and total allegiance of our own free will. If there's something in our life that means more to us than knowing God and keeping his commandments, then that has become our God. This verse means that God is our only object of worship. He is the authority. He is the truth. Our lives become so cluttered. We fill our lives with family, friends, work, school, recreation. There's so many things that crave our attention. Yet some think that if we give God an hour on Sunday, then we're okay. No. The first commandment prohibits the worship of anyone or anything other than Jehovah God. If God is not central in our affections and thoughts, we violated the first commandment. It's actually not an easy commandment to follow because it focuses upon our desires. It focuses upon our purpose. It focuses upon our goals. So since there's only room for one true love, it should be God. Who or what is number one? Realize that this truth is not an option. It's a commandment. They're called the Ten Commandments. Either we obey the commandment or we don't. And if we follow the commandment, we understand that God is a God who has loved us. We will celebrate again this morning that Christ came to die for us that we might have a personal relationship with God so that we might know him and love him personally. So that we could truly love Jesus, love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and worship him only. You shall have no other gods before me. Christ is to be all in all to every one of us. Let us pray. Father, this morning, even as we consider these words and the context of them, we realize that, Father, we are all falling short of what you want for us. And ultimately, Christ is our only hope. And I pray that if there's one here who has never surrendered their heart to Jesus and called upon Christ to be their Savior, that they would do so. Father, for those of us who profess Christ, help us as we order our priorities in our own personal lives, in our families, in our friendships, at work, recreation, our investments, in all of these things, help us to consider the reality of honoring you, of worshiping you, of loving you above and beyond all of those things, and then how we are to live our lives out in all of those relationships as God-loving people, as those who worship the only true God. Thank you for how you have loved us. Turn our attention now to Jesus and how he gave his life for us. And move in our hearts by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please uh, take your cup, if you have it, and reveal the bread. And I want to reflect on what we have looked at in the past, and have you turn in your Bible, if you can, back to Genesis chapter 8. Because we are looking at the history of sacrifice according to the scriptures. And you know that we studied already in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve sinned and God came looking for them. God had not lost them. The question, Adam, where are you, is a question that God asked Adam because God wanted Adam to look at himself. And we need to first of all look at ourselves and so then we understand that God committed the sacrifice of the lamb and covered them with skins. And so God was the first one who offered a sacrifice for the sin of Adam and Eve, establishing a pattern that would be looking forward to Christ. The second sacrifice was that Adam and Eve had taught their children, Cain and Abel, uh, to come to God with a sacrifice. And uh, Cain wanted to bring a sacrifice of himself, of his own work, of what he had brought about. And Abel brought the sacrifice of the flock, first of the flock, and that was the one that was accepted. And you know the story, Cain killed Abel. Devil thought, I've eliminated the line of the Messiah. And then of course Seth was born. But now as we continue the early history of sacrifices, I want to look with you at Noah. Noah. How many people think that when God asked Noah to build the ark and to put animals in it, he was to bring a male and female of every animal that was on the planet. Right? Isn't that what we're all taught? Mm -hmm. And yet in Genesis chapter 7, it says, You shall take with you seven, each of every clean animal, male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean and male and his female. So yes, God wanted two of everyone but also wanted clean animals. What was the purpose of that? Well, come with me to chapter 8, and notice in verse 20, that then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a smooth, soothing aroma then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, and that's still true, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. Verse 22 is a very interesting verse for those who think that there's this thing called uh, global change and <laughs> climate change and all that stuff. Look at this verse. While the earth remains... And that's where we are now. Seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. So there's your climate change. God has created these things to be. And they will always be. It will be cold in the winter and warm in the summer. That's just the way God's created it. But back to verse 20. Noah understood that God had established a system of sacrifice and put upon the ark the animals for that sacrifice. Every one of those sacrifices is showing the direction of who Jesus will. In other words, it's a type of a, a foreshadowing of the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. God would not accept the sacrifice of an unclean animal. And Jesus came as a perfect sacrifice. He was sinless in every way and therefore the only one who could be the sacrifice for your sin and mine. The history of sacrifice goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. And so Jesus said, as we take the bread, he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us remember Jesus. And I find, and, and I trust that all of us who know Christ as our personal Savior are walking in fellowship with him. Let us partake. Please take your cup and turn it over. 
of the juice. The shed blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from our sin. This cup does not cleanse us. Jesus' blood cleanses us. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. We remember what Jesus did upon the cross. And Jesus said that this is the cup of the new covenant which is shed. And we are to drink it until we drink it new with him in his kingdom. And I invite all those who know Christ as their Savior, walking with him, let us partake together. Our Father, how grateful we are that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ was accepted by you as a holy God so that we now can come boldly to the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in time of need because of Jesus. We thank you that you have set the pattern all the way many years ago that blood must be shed for the forgiveness of sin and that Jesus' blood was shed for us. We rejoice in that truth. And we pray that today we will truly, not just today, but every day, honor you as the God of all creation and worship you and worship you alone. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I invite you to stand with me for our closing worship song. <coughs> You are the last party in the conference.